So it takes about three days to shift the biological mechanisms to make you a morning person. We are all more or less a slave to these mechanisms. Three days of pain, the rest is easy. If you are a very strongly genetically determined night owl, that's a thing. So there are genetic mutations, they call them polymorphisms, that make some people night owls. They feel best psychologically and physically going to sleep at about 1, 2, or 3 a.m. and waking up somewhere around 10, 11 a.m. or noon. That exists not just during development or teen years, but that exists, not just for social reasons. Other people are true morning people. They feel absolutely best going to sleep around 8 p.m. or 9 p.m. 10 p.m. will be late for them and they feel great waking up at 4, 5, or 6 a.m. Okay, most people feel best going to sleep somewhere between 10 and midnight and waking up somewhere between 6 a.m. and 8 a.m. or so, maybe 5.30 to 8 a.m. So those are three bins of the night owl, the morning person, and then the more typical schedule, but it's heavily weighted toward that typical schedule if you look at the general population. So if somebody wants to get up earlier, you need to stack the four primary, what are called zeitgebers or timekeepers. So named because some of the early chronobiologists that discovered this stuff and the underlying mechanisms were German. So the number one zeitgeber, the number one way to shift your circadian clock, which is this cluster of neurons that sits a few centimeters above the roof of your mouth, is to view bright light at a time when you want to be awake, AKA the morning. Okay, so that's why I say get outside, look at the sun, toward the sun, don't force yourself to stare at it, don't damage your eyes, blink as needed, no sunglasses, eyeglasses, corrective lenses and contacts are absolutely fine, even if they have UV protection. Okay, however, if you combine that with another Zeitgeber, the second most powerful Zeitgeber is exercise or movement. So if you do some jumping jacks, you skip some rope, now you're starting to stack different Zeitgebers. And I'll explain the mechanisms in a moment. If you then also add caffeine, you can entrain, as it's called, the circadian clock to be alert at that time a bit more. And I'll be honest, if I'm going to exercise first thing in the morning, I need caffeine. I can't wait that 60 to 90 minutes. If I need to jump right into exercise, I find it's easiest for me to do 30 minutes after waking, three hours after waking, or 11 hours after waking. And a lot of people find that the same. But of course, exercise when you can, because it's that important. But if you want to, quote unquote, optimize your energy levels for exercise, typically people will notice that has to do with your temperature rhythm. Okay, so we've got sunlight. We've got exercise or movement of any kind. It could be jumping jacks, could be walking. You don't have to do a full workout. And then caffeine and in some cases food. I'm not big on eating first thing in the morning. I don't like to eat until 11 a.m. or noon. That's when my first meal arrives for me. Just naturally, that's when I get hungry. It's all caffeine and hydration prior to that. But if you were to eat something first thing in the morning, you that's part of the way you entrain your circadian clock to wake up to essentially wake you up earlier. And then the fourth one is a social rhythm. If you're interacting with other people, you are going to entrain your clock to that as well. So there's a socially there's a social component to it, circadian entrainment. Now, the pathways for these are from the eye, in the case of viewing light, to the circadian clock, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. In the case of caffeine, it's more general. In the case of exercise, there's literally a brainstem to circadian clock connection, a big super highway of neuronal connections that then so-called entrains your circadian clock. Remember, your circadian clock generates an intrinsic 24-hour rhythm such that if we put you into constant dark or constant light, you would still sleep for a given bout and then be alert for a given bout with a little bit of a nap. It just is what would call free run. It would drift a little later each day. This is what happens when you go to Vegas. This is what happens when you're in an environment without a lot of cues about the day, uh, the sunlight uh, rising and setting cycle. Sunlight, exercise, caffeine and eating, and social interactions bring your circadian clock into alignment with all of those Zeitgebers. So when I said it takes three days, if tomorrow you want to start beginning the process of becoming an early riser, you'd set your alarm for 5 a.m. No matter what time you went to sleep the night before, you're going to get up and you're going to do the four things that I described. Maybe leave out food if you don't want to eat. Maybe leave out caffeine if you want to delay by 90 minutes. It's going to hurt. And then by the early afternoon, you'll be dragging a bit. And you just have to be careful to not overindulge in caffeine, which will then cause you to fall asleep later. Then you want to go to sleep at your now naturally slightly earlier sleep time. The next day, you'll notice you'll it'll be a little bit easier to do the morning routine I just described. And by the third day, you ought to be waking up with or before the alarm by a few minutes or moments because your circadian clock has phase shifted. Okay, it's phase advanced, as we say, your circadian clock intrinsic to you generates a 24 
24.2 or a 24.3 hour rhythm. It's not perfectly 24 hours. And that we believe, we don't know, but the just so story is that it's that it's such that you're able to then shift that clock in one or the other direction. You can phase advance, so you wake up earlier and go to sleep earlier. You can phase delay. How do you phase delay? Well, you're probably doing this already. Everyone nowadays pretty much qualifies as a shift worker by the strict and not so strict criteria of shift work, which is, are you doing any kind of cognitive activity after 9 p.m.? Are you viewing any kind of bright lights after 9.30 p.m.? Most people would say yes. So the, the diabolical thing about the circadian timing system is that it requires a lot of bright light, ideally from sunlight, but a lot of bright light early in the day to make you a morning and daytime person. Mm -hmm. But it requires just a little bit of bright light, even from an artificial source, after the hours of about 9.30 p.m. till 4 a.m. to quash your melatonin and make it difficult to sleep, or if you sleep, to make that sleep not as effective. There's a simple remedy, however, which is, and this is a beautiful study published in Science Reports in 2022, if you view sunlight in the afternoon, even for five minutes or so, could be late afternoon, could be sunset, take off your sunglasses, look in the direction of the sun, so now looking west, you adjust the sensitivity of your retina, the neurons in the back of your eye, such that bright light later at night doesn't have quite as much effect to suppress melatonin. It reduces the melatonin suppressive effects by about 50% or offsets those. So I think of this afternoon viewing as, well, first of all, it's nice to look at a sunset. If you're indoors in an environment like this, even if there are bright lights on, get outside for a few minutes before the sun sets. This is especially important in winter. Even if you can't see the sun as an object, get some sunlight in your eyes, and that will at least partially offset the effects of bright light in your eyes at night, partially. And I refer to this more or less as your Netflix inoculation, so that that night you can be on your phone or watch Netflix and it's not going to disrupt your sleep as much, but it will still disrupt your sleep somewhat. But let's, you know, unless, like Rick Rubin's very diligent about wearing the uh, red lens glasses. I've started doing that as well. Um, but if you don't do that, you, well, I'm guessing he also sees the sunset in the evening. Mm -hmm. um, he's very attached for good scientific reasons uh, to the sunlight thing. But these are little things that take just moments, right? They're essentially zero cost that can really improve your sleep. But that's how you become a morning person. If you want to become a night person, you do the opposite. You view bright light between the hours of 4 p.m. and 10 p.m. And there, then you will phase delay or phase shift mm -hmm. in a delayed way your circadian clock, making you want to wake up later the next morning. And people always ask, you know, do dogs have the same mechanisms? Absolutely. The intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells, the one that project to the clock and carry all of this um, thing about circadian entrainment to sunlight are present, as far as we know, in every extant mammalian species, every mammalian species that's that's alive today. Um, and, you know, th this is a system that evolved from bacteria that's very similar to the opsins, the light absorbing molecules that are in the insect eye. It's a very primordial system. It's organized very differently anatomically in the retina. And to me, it's actually one of the more beautiful systems in, in all of us. In fact, the one thing that no one can seem to defeat, you're never going to biohack away is circadian biology. This, this, you know, fluctu 24 hour fluctuation in energy and focus, you know, some people require less sleep, but we're, we're all um, more or less a slave to these mechanisms. And, uh, you know, it's a good thing that we are because it forces us to rest. Neuroplasticity occurs during sleep. They push down adenosine. You know, it takes us through these natural ebbs and cycles of cognition. I'm obsessed by the idea that in sleep, you know, the conscious mind obviously is not in control. The unconscious mind can geyser up thoughts. The brain is organizing things more in terms of symbols. Time and space are very, uh, very organized very differently in dreams. And there's a lot of information to be gleaned from dreams. It's just that we don't yet understand what the symbols mean. The kind of classic Freudian Jungian um, interpretations are certainly not going to be complete. But, you know, I, I'm so grateful that we get this thing called sleep. And I think thanks to the great Matt Walker, we now understand that the whole thing of all sleep when I'm dead is a really dumb mindset. And, you know, at my team at the Huberman Lab podcast, we sometimes joke that we win by sleeping. You know, when we're in the peak of things, we all encourage each other to like get rest, you know, get rest. Like we really prioritize sleep. 